welcome back to a boat called Wanda. It's absolutely freezing again here. It's about two and a half degrees, which means I'm stuck here and I can't move more than three inches away from this here, which is this little heater, uh, which is giving me some comfort. But never mind, I've got a cunning new plan to deal with this cold weather, and that lays in this box over here. <laughs> well, actually, that bad boy is not so much for me, but more for Wanda and the painting that I'm going to do on Wanda a bit later on. Let me open that up later and show you more about that then. But for now, I just wanted to go over a couple of questions that came up after the last update I made about the um, compression to that timber in the core and also that um, angle in the cockpit. So let's just go and have a bit more of a look at that so I can explain better. Right, so here we are in the main cabin and this is the compression post here, which is a very, very solid, uh, decent piece of timber that supports the, uh, the mast. As you can see, it um, starts off, it's um, sitting on the keel, uh, it comes up this way, and then on top of this compression post is a really solid beam that goes across this way, and this beam sort of supports the entire coach roof in this area. Directly above this beam is the bottom layer of skin um, of that deck, which is of course made up like a GRP sandwich. There's this bottom skin, there's plywood in the middle, and then there was a top skin. Okay, so up on deck, we've got this um, bottom skin, which is the part that I cut out last week. And then here was the uh, marine ply, and then there was a top skin of laminate, and then there was the mast pushing down there. So basically, the mast is being pulled down by the rigging, uh, pushing down this way, and it was just collapsing that um, wood here. Um, now the wood wasn't wet, but I guess it was a soft part out of the beam beneath it, that mast compression post, this was the piece that gave way. And so that all just like flattened out and compressed and, and went all wobbly. And that's the part that I'm uh, going to replace with some mild steel, which will be fully encapsulated in resin, um, just so that there's nothing that can basically compress. I mean, it shouldn't need to be that strong. There were some serious issues with the rigging and forces on this part that um, caused it to deform that way. The second item from the last update which uh, I got some feedback about and comments on was the um, angle in this, this cockpit seating. So thanks everybody for getting back to me on that and pointing out that you know you don't want to redesign everything because there needs to be a low point for water to gather, you know, which, which I get makes perfect sense. But strangely enough, when you look at it, and this is the high point here in the middle, so it's the back seat here that drops down. This is actually where the drain is. You can see this small hole here. This goes through this combing and on the other side, there's this outlet here, so it's meant to allow water to, to come out of the cockpit and drain away. But the frustrating thing is this is actually the high point. So this gap here that I showed you last week means that all the water is just going to come and pull down here because this is actually the low point. It slopes down this way and it slopes back that way and this is the low point here. So it is just a little bit confusing. Um, I'm sure the boat's not moved so much. It's probably more or less the way it came out of the mould, I guess. Right, let's take a closer look at this bad boy. Oh man, my feet are cold, my hands are cold. It looks like it's in a thousand bits, as could be expected. Screws, don't lose those. One wheel, two wheel. Red things, handles. <coughs> this looks like the business end. It's really difficult to work with these thick gloves on, but I can't take them off because my fingers will drop off. Now all I need is some magic fairies to come along and to turn this into this. Now the reason I've got this bad boy here is not just to warm my own poor frozen fingers and toes. It's actually to uh, heat Wander up. Now a couple of months ago I was talking about taking Wander down to like a professional boatyard to have her sprayed to get the deck and the top side sprayed. Um, and basically at that point of the project I just sort of had enough and I wanted it done. I've had some time to reflect and I've thought about how much that's going to cost me and so I've come around to the idea that I am actually going to do not all of it but as much of it myself as I can and I'm going to turn this filthy cold dust ridden shed 
into a professional spray paint shop. Now what I need to do in order to turn this shed into a spray painting shop is two things. I need to control the heat and I need to control the dust. Now this is going to be used to control the heat because what I'm going to do is create a tent around Wanda and then use this to pump warm air into that tent so that I can get the temperature up to about 15, 16 degrees and the humidity down to get a good um, environment for spray painting. I'm not actually going to do the spray painting myself. I am actually going to bring in somebody I know that's a professional spray painter and has agreed to do this for me on the weekends in his sort of free time. Um, and that's going to save me a lot of money, but I'm going to do all the preparation myself, all the priming myself, all the sanding back myself, and just get him to come in and do the gloss. And that should save me literally thousands and thousands of pounds. So that's the plan. This is going to run on kerosene. It can run on diesel or kerosene, but uh, kerosene's a lot cleaner. And with diesel, there's a risk that it's going to put out a bit of pollution, carbon particles, and that can be detrimental to the spray paint. Um, so anyway, I'm going to get some kerosene for this tomorrow and fire it up and give it a test, but for now I'll put it away. Okay, so here's this piece of mild steel which I've put into this um, core cavity uh, which goes underneath the mast step as I sort of discussed in the last update. Uh, and to be honest, I never really was that keen on this idea, particularly since I've, I've got this off cut now. And fortunately I got a lot of comments about um, different alternatives I could use to mild steel or stainless steel and one of those was G10 fiberglass which to be honest I'd never heard of before but after doing some research I think that's actually an excellent idea. So here we go, I've ordered some in the mail and this arrived the other day so I'm going to uh, open this up and check this out. Now. It came in 5mm sheets and I need 15mm so I've just got three of these and I'm going to put them together. So there we go, one, two, three. Okay, so here's the final product, finished product ready to go. So it's about 15 mils thick, there's three pieces here, and I've just um, ground off a little bit of each side to get a little bit of a slope, or to help that slope or curve around the coach roof. And I've scored it up nicely so it's got lots of grip on it. And uh, now it's just a matter of bedding it down. Well, it's been a while since I've done this, putting core down. I think I'll need a fair bit on this side because there's a real dip here. And then a bit thinner over here.
Okay, that looks about right. Okay, it looks like it's squeezing out nicely around the sides. Let's check my level. Oh, that's good. Flat, nice and flat. Just make sure there's no sticky stuff on this side. Okay, and then finally a use for this piece of mild steel. Okay, so I'll let that sit overnight and then tomorrow I can come back and start to fill it up around the sides and laminate it. And then there was a question on how I'm going to put the mast heel back here and um, I've been thinking about that and I'll show you that later when I come around to doing that. Now before I go any further with the painting preparation on the top sides, uh, at least before I put down any primer, I need to basically find a way of uh, striking that some water line along the side of the hull, particularly in the area where the top sides were repaired, because for that part at least there's no water line that's been totally scrubbed out where those repairs were made. So these are the tools that I've got together it's for the purpose of um, measuring that water line. And I've got a mixture of old and new technologies. I've got a self-leveling laser, an inclinometer, spirit level, and a plumb line. Now I did a very quick test the other day with the laser. I'm using my trusty camera tripod here and I've just um, hot glued on some uh, sticks to sort of give it a little bit more height so that I can get this level with the water line and then I just um, adjust it up and down. What I noticed when I did the test was that the laser line and the existing water line were completely at odds with each other. Um, and then I realized that the boat actually wasn't very level in this uh, workshop. So the first test I did, I went up to the deck and I used this plumb line and I measured the distance from the tow rail all around the boat to um, the, the floor below. And these were the results I got. As I was measuring around the tow rail at various reference points, such as where the stanchion bases were and the cleat on the midships, I could see that um, right at the start, the port side was basically lower by 12 millimetres, 35 millimetres, 45, 52, 58 and 34. So at midships basically there's a 52 millimetre gap or difference between the, the sides. So that just goes to show how unlevel the boat was and if I tried to use uh, a laser to strike the waterline on this side, the port side that doesn't have any water line whatsoever, it would have actually have been uh, about 55 millimetres higher than the other side which was just ridiculous. Okay, so first step is I need to level the boat. Now basically I've got uh, two different reference points that I can go with. I've got the level that the keel is sitting on, which should be uh, mirrored by the level of the cockpit sole, and I can use my inclinometer for that to work out uh, which way that's going. And then for measuring the sort of beam angle, um, I've set up these trestles across the midship cleats and of course made sure that the trestles are exactly the same height got this very straight piece of mahogany beam across and just by putting the inclinometer on that I can see that I've got a measure of about um, 0.9 of a degree uh, discrepancy. Let me try and draw this out to explain the biggest problem that I've got at the moment and that's if I look at Wanda I've got two points of reference. I've got the level or angle of the keel which is perfectly mirrored by the level of the cockpit sole and when I go and use a spirit level, both of these match up. And then I've got the angle or the line of the existing water level as it is today. The problem that I've got is, at the moment of the way the boat's sitting, there's a slight angle here. So this is kind of like this angle. So the keel's not flat with the floor. And then basically the water line isn't level with the floor either. So if I level out the keel and the cockpit sole, I'm going to make the angle of the water line even worse. Or if I try and move the boat to get the water line exactly flat with the horizon now, or the laser leveler, then this angle of the keel is going to be worse. So basically these don't match up. 
Now I've been really struggling with this for a couple of days trying to work out what do I trust. Do I trust the keel or do I trust the existing water line? Is this existing water line sound? Because if it is, I'll just level the boat, forget about the angle of the keel and the cockpit. So I'll just get that water line flat because then I can use my laser, I can position that around the boat and use that to strike the water line. Or the new Okay, so the guys from the yard have finished this work now, and I must say they did an amazing job. I'm really impressed with the team here. Um, and she's perfectly level, so yeah, great job. Thanks very much, guys. So as you can see on this side, there's about 60 millimetres worth of sort of plywood that's propped up this side of the cradle. And that makes sense because I noticed there was about a 50 millimetre difference between measuring the top of the cap rail down to the floor. So she should be perfectly level. Well, she is because I've seen from the inclinometer upstairs on the deck. So I guess what's happened is the cradle's now a little bit this way compared to the floor, but Wanda's perfectly straight, which means Wanda was never sitting absolutely perpendicular in the cradle. She was always leaning a little bit to one side. So next job, get all of my crap across here, put back under here, which is a real shame because it's really nice to have this amazing tidy space, but I'm going to have to clutter it up again with my junk now. Okay, so I've got my laser level set up here, set up to the correct height, and basically I'm bringing the gloss line down by about 15 millimeters. It's best to have too much gloss because you can always shift the anti-fouling up, but you can't go the other way around, so that's the way I've set it up. Now I'm going to do this in several sections and move the tripod along as I go. The reason for that is, number one, I can't really get further enough back with a tripod to get the whole boat in one view. Um, but also, over about 10 metres, there's a um, tolerance of about 6 millimetres, so the laser will sort of lose its accuracy over that distance. So just to avoid that, I'm going to keep the laser you know, no more than 2 metres away from the hull and move it along. So I've got my tape, I've got my roller to help smooth the tape down, and it's just time to do it. <laughs> Now there's a hell of a lot of non-skid material on the boat, mainly all around the top of the coach roof, the cockpit combings, and then on the aft cabin top. It's really, really thick as well. So before I can um, paint, prime and paint the boat, I need to get rid of all that non-skid to bring it back down to, to um, surface level um, so that we can prime it, paint it, and then I think we'll actually spray the non-skid back on. So to do that, I'm gonna try uh, using an angle grinder. Now, before everyone jumps out of their seats and tells me not to do that, there's a couple of caveats here. I've got a new angle grinder, and this has actually got a variable speed control, uh, unlike my last one. So what I'm thinking is I'll, I'll run it as low as I can at the slowest speed, and I'm using a uh, 80 grit rather than a sort of 36, 24. Um, so I'm going to use it very, very slowly with a um, less sort of gritty disc and just try and get maybe 60 or 70% of the non-skid off and then come back with my orbital sander just to get it, the rest off and get it flat. Now before I go ahead and do the entire deck, I'm just gonna do a little test patch first and I'll use the cockpit hatch cover. Because um, it's a nice day, I'm actually gonna take that outside and uh, do a little bit there. The other thing that I've got which is new is this dust card for this grinder. And so this just hooks up to a vacuum and I want to see what this is like and how much dust it actually does get out of the grinder because if it's good enough then I can just basically use this on deck again. I mean the other reason I need to be really mindful about using a grinder on deck is just the mess that goes everywhere and because obviously I've got a couple of neighbours here now I need to sort of minimise that. So anyway let's head out and uh, give this a go.
Okay, so this cockpit hatch is done now. So all of the sort of peaks and troughs have been rubbed out. And along the side where there used to be an edge of a couple of millimetres where the non-skid started, that's all been scrubbed out. So this is all sort of flat here. So I think I'll follow the same approach for the deck because it's going to be pretty quick work. I'll use my grinder, very slow speed, and go through all the non-skid with that to try and get sort of 70, 90% of it off. And then that last 10%, I'll use my orbital sander, which is a little bit more um, gentle. It's probably going to be a day or two's work, I guess. OK, well, I think I'll leave the update here for this week. Before I sign off, I'll just do a little bit of a recap so that you can see everything I've done. So I've got some laminate setting down in this cockpit area. I've drilled out all the screw holes and filled them with thickened epoxy. There's a couple of areas where there's some quite deep gouges, as you can see there. So that's all been filled up. And then there's one top layer of laminate all over that. I've got all the non-skids scrubbed off the aft cabin and I've sanded the aft cabin to prepare it for a primer. The cockpit seating area has been sanded back. All of the non-skids have been removed from the cockpit combing. All the non-skids off the coach roof. I've got that mast step core drying in there and I've got a little bit more fairing to do over here. And finally, I've got the water line marked along here. Although I am actually going to take this off and do it again, I'm going to do it in a really fine line tape that's about four or five millimetres thick because it'll be a little bit more flexible and give me just a little bit more of a um, perfect line along here. So that won't take me long. OK, well, thanks for watching. As always, if you've got any comments or feedback, just please leave it down the bottom there. It's always great to get your ideas and quite often it'll give me a different uh, approach to what I'm doing here. So uh, next week I think I'll have to get back to that heating unit and set that up properly now so that I can start to get some heat in this uh, shed uh, so that I can get some primer down. So hopefully that'll be the next update next week. Well, I'll see you then. Bye.